My name is Brian, but I'm guessing you know that already. What you don't know is that my paper is actually titled Two Cheers for A1 Everyone's Brew. Two Cheers going back to E.M. Foster. A1, referring to people like me, the Anglo-Indian. Everyone's Brew, because that's why you are here. And, uh, the Anglo-Indian community seems to be in the teapot. I start now. One of the tenets of the Christian faith is that man and woman were made equal. This concept may have worked in their original home, but once Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden, dissimilarities and disparities began to surface. Then man, so it is recorded, wrested control and has also retained it by and large. It took more than 20 year, centuries of stony sleep, I may add, for the world of glitz and glamour to cry out shrilly but Concertedly, me too. Of course, a satanic man called Harvey was victimized. He was the greatest victimizer of them all. They all agreed. And the scene then pans out to India. Surely the rape country of the world, where even pregnant goats are not safe. And to nearby our land, where the casting couch Hidden molester seems to be a wolf in kadar clothing. Ready with a seemingly innocent pat on the cheek or even a tongue-in-cheek comment that is allowed to pass. In this manner, even the sacrosanct gilded edifice of parliament is tarnished and trashed. In my rather unholy book that is soon to be completed and released like a plague, I just think, upon the world, I call to account the creators of the Anglo-Indian prototypes, those less than pulp fiction peddlers who brought to fruition hordes of ill-gotten characters through centuries of colonial conquest with such copious grist to feed their dirty old mills, the truth clung timidly in the corner of the big box that has now come to be recognized even internationally as uh, Anglo-Indian studies. For Pandora's hour had not yet come. Even now the voice of Pandora, a.k.a. Ms. Trotter, is a muted me too. But since there is not a single spokesperson for pa Pandora's partner and spouse, me too, then let the message ring out loud and clear. It is time. Brian Trotter, as in the singer guy named after me, aka Brihan, as in the famous whiskey maker from India, a.k.a. Briani, you know that is not on your menu today. Brian Trotter is here, not just here, but ready um, and armed. Friends, fellow Indians, countrymen, lend me your ears. I use the word countrymen deliberately. I have said it scores of times before and have even put it down in black and white. There she is. That an Anglo-Indian is a citizen of India, full stop, with no hyphens, question marks, or exclamation marks. No one who has relinquished the little blue book with gold lettering can claim that right. No other country in the whole wide world accords full rights and privilege, privileges to all members of this microscopic minority community 
For as an Anglo-Indian per se, every member of the community shares the inalien inalienable rights and wrongs that every other fellow countryman enjoys, on paper at least. No other country has defined in very specific terms who or what is an Anglo-Indian. So, though we are still a hyphenated, sometimes constipated, minuscule minority, we have our place in the sun, and that is here in the sacred land called Mother India. Diaspora has an ugly meaning for me. It reminds me of spores and sores and germs and mutations. I reject the concept unilater unilaterally because we, or at least I, have had enough of that. But then, even as Jackie Chan asks, who am I? Yes, India is the homeland of the Anglo-Indian. Our Indian women never did follow their men overseas for conquest or trade or booty. They stayed at home. Since exceptions prove the rule, they say, let's call to mind the disputed identity of Merle Oberon. The white men from all over Europe came in clusters as humble traders, but ended up as spoliators and makers of empire. The jewel being Great Britain's Indian one. Things started out in very clear terms, in black and white, and it must have been the very staid, orthodox, naive, or plain jealous Indian male who could think that the women of his tribe, or clan, or caste were low enough to mingle, or cohabit, or whatever, with a white man. To think that the worst kind of white man and the worst type of Indian woman deliberately got together to spawn a bastard race goes beyond even imagination. And when Professor M. K. Nayak succinctly sums up the equation, carefully attributing the original thought to another, that necessity was the father of the Anglo-Indian, see M. K. Nayak's mirror on the wall, page uh, 54, he doesn't even realize that he is damning all women, all women of India in particular. Who then, or what, is an Anglo-Indian? The Anglo-Indians themselves have had precious little to say, saddled as they were, then with a foreign tongue, and not willing to further antagonize the races that spawned them. That haloed trotter, Frank Anthony, too, has little to contribute here. He only lists a great number of renowned Englishmen who actually did have a touch of the proverbial tar brush. Ruskin Bond's Rusty, whom we meet in the room and on the roof and also in vagrants in the valley, is aware that he is of mixed stock, but he is determined to above the crass class di distinctions that characterize both black, white and black zealots. And more true to form, he absorbs and fully accepts the ways of his young Indian friends. Rusty refuses to be a nobody. He will also not be just anybody. He will become somebody, a recognizable, reasonable, balanced human being. Alan Seeley, whose real name could possibly Irwin Trotter, in his Trotternama, does not dwell on the who or the what of the Anglo-Indian identity, because the book, in brackets, a New Testament that rubbishes and trashes all the old stuff, the book is a fictional journey into the heart and soul of the Anglo-Indian, and he emphasizes everywhere the sameness with difference that makes the Anglo-Indian just like every other person who calls India home. Of course, every now and then, we are reminded that names are important. As the politician called Biplab 
rudely and coarsely reminded Diana. But why didn't he go for the jugular and name Sonia? Wasn't he so near and yet so far? Was the whole shameful farce simply a twisted casting couch controversy? Let me just leave it at that. Right from 1975, when I became a teacher, up to the present, my college, the new college here in Chennai, could never get my name right. Last year, 13 years after I retired, I was presented with a plaque for contributing heavily, in my time of course, to the staff cricket team. I returned it, for it was actually meant for a Mr. Peepins. Since most of us love eating, my college, of which I am genuinely proud, made me a gastronomic delight. My name become, became Briani. Oh, liver as a side dish. My name is actually Oliver. And uh, Poppins, since most Indians love to polish off their meals with something sweet. I didn't return my PhD though, for I was afraid the university would confiscate my certificate for not having a more patriotic name. They changed my Dickensian middle name, Oliver, to a more lilting or lilver. Even I was ashamed thereafter to ask for more. So, what have my fellow Indians to say about people of my kind? Confining myself to fiction only. Plenty lot, I must confess. Not all bad or worse, a mere 99%. Only the great Ashokamitran cares not more than a cow pat. You know what a cow pat is? A.K.A. Rati. Okay? Whether his characters are Anglo-Indian or not. A railway colony for the first 60 years of the 20th century, <coughs> at least, uh, uh, yes, could not have been accurately described without a sprinkling of Anglo-Indian characters in his, in, and Ash Ashokamitran is aware of this fact. Though the Anglo-Indian characters in his book, The 18th Parallel, are marginal, he has to include them, warts and all. Ashokamitran does not judge his characters. They rise and fall through their own actions. And like a true artist, he allows the narrative to run its course but this is not the case with most in other Indian writers on the theme. This group indulges heavily in authorial intrusion, and this makes the diligent reader wonder if the character in any particular book is spouting venom, or in fact, it is the author who is venting his slash her spleen. This is the case with Malkraj Anand, Manohar Malgonkar, David Davidar and Saraskovsky, to name just a few good men. It is amazing that Anand Schooley has not been examined carefully enough. While the early parts of his narrative have had their fair share of bloomers, Anand reserves the worst for the last, a no-holds-barred attack on one of his characters, one who probably did not even need to be in the book at all. May Mannering is this creature, an Anglo-Indian, resident of Simla, and so Ananda was a bitch who gave herself to all comers. Mrs. Mannering has run through husbands from Germany, Persia, and England, and is now dallying with a certain doctor who happens to be an army major. She latches her lascivious lashes on a newly acquired servant, Munu, but surprisingly rejects his overt and covert advances for mental encounters of the closest kind. When the doctor advises May not to take too close an interest in Manu, he is suddenly down with a deadly disease and she abandons him. That Manu was too easily released by his former protectors 
and that he repaid his debt to Harihar by accepting carnal relations with the Kakol's wife are incidents that may be forgotten or, and forgiven. But when it comes to the turn of Mrs. Mannering, Anand gives vent to a pent up fury that almost reveals a dark secret. Because the stereotype always portrays the Anglo-Indian woman as loose and easily available, Anand may have himself been an active player in this dark diatribe. You may quite as well say that this is mere conjecture, but when a writer gives his characters no way to defend themselves or their actions, it is, in my eyes at least, only tit for tat when the reader or the critic indulges in the same kind of thing. When you heard the word penguin in India, the name da David Davidar used to come to mind, not because he was doing the walk, but because rumors of the casting couch variety had to be hush-hushed pronto. And yet writers like him have had no hesitation in informing elite, mostly gullible, mostly international readers that Indian men go to the circus, none other than the able circus, to watch with eyeballs literally popping out, I quote, the sagging thighs and tits of poorly paid, fair-skinned Anglo-Indian women. This is from the House of Blue Mangoes, page 228, who worked there. If this is the whole truth about the Indian male, the species deserves no better than another character, Cynthia's overall judgment. Hypocritical, I quote again, hypocritical, double-dealing Indian bastards, page 295, is what she calls them. Fortunately or unfortunately, Cynthia's words go unchallenged, but the credit must go to the writer for introducing or reintroducing the P word, a.k.a. pariah, or as Indians would call it, pariah, into modern English fiction, uh, <coughs> Indian fiction in English. Having been called a miserable, miserable pariah by his wife, Kanan Dore turns the tables on her by asking, if I am a pariah, what does that make you? Page 358. The protagonist has quite forgotten that the Anglo-Indian male and female does not subscribe to caste. In fact, the Anglo-Indian is the first liberated Indian of the modern era. John Donne, I hope you remember him, the English poet, when securely married, raised the conundrum, when thou hast done, thou hast not done, for I have more. His wife's name was more. Like him too, I have more. But I've got the time. <laughs> but I will make it short. I will not tell you how to identify an Anglo-Indian bell. You only have to visit Chandni Chauk with Manohar Mal Malgonkar for that. I will not tell you how to identify an elderly Anglo-Indian male by the shape of his backside. Molly K will help you, especially if he is lying face down in a bush. I will not tell you how to genetically isolate and thereby preserve or destroy an Anglo-Indian soul. Saros Kawasji will give you the lowdown. I will not tell you how to abandon the presently very fashionable study of the Anglo-Indian. Laura Roy Chowdhury will provide the perfect solution. The community should put a stop to their procreation activities so that the bastard race can be wiped from the face of the earth. Unfortunately, she is cohabiting with Bunty Boy and, uh, well, Bunty dents her confidence when he says, yes, we all of us have some tash in us. Racial purity is not only not a myth, it is an intentional and effective fallacy. Nothing much 
has been written about the Anglo-Indian male, poor guy, that selfish, foolish, bumptious, drunken, ill at ease, sleazy, good for nothing, Hindi filmy style, villain without a cause. Maybe that's the reason why my books don't sell so well. Yeah. In recent times, even my once popular articles are now rejected and discarded. But as I've almost said somewhere, I just want to get along. If you want to make me and my kind specimens, there's enough junk uh, out there. Just a minute, please. To conjure up many more annual gatherings. It was Oscar Wilde who once said that he wanted to live, not just make a living. Echoing his sentiments, I'll kindly leave that latter part to others, researchers mostly, since they must have something to do. Let me remind you all once again, it is time. But in the end, as my favorite, the inimitable Freddie Mercury croons, nothing really matters. Jai Hind.